you. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love, Lord God. Father, we do uh, thank you, Lord, for what Brother Dale brought in Sunday school class, Lord God. Uh, a lot of information there, Lord God. And uh, Father, uh, I pray that uh, you bless him for uh, his work and study in the matter, Lord. And Father, uh, we're looking to hear from you in the preaching hour, Lord God, that uh, you'll give us what you'd have us to have today, Lord, that you have the pastor uh, anointed, ready to preach, Lord. Father, that, uh, that, uh, Father, that uh, everybody has uh, got their, their sins forgiven before they got here at church, Lord God. And Father, that uh, they were clean vessels ready to receive your word, Lord. And we'll thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. In name you pray. Amen. 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 All right. Good to see Kevin this morning. Good to be here. Amen. Peter, I don't know. Amen. <laughs> All right, well, welcome once again to the Hour of Depression. Good to have everybody here. Amen. Let's see. Good morning, Russ. Golly. No wonder preachers get depressed. You gotta take drugs. Uh, for you. Just stand up here and look out there. You'll understand. <laughs> Amen. All right, Tim, you ready? Yes, sir. Come sing a song. Very nice. Uh. <laughs> oh, no. All, right. All right. Good morning again. You stand, turn to page 442. Yeah. Yep, I can see what you're talking about. I can see myself, and that's not fun. All right. <laughs>
There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All this peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day! When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear. No more sickness, no pain, no more pardon over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Amen. Amen. I do have a drone question. You can operate one around the world from here? Yes. Oh. Man. Wonderful. Okay, yeah, I'm watching it. Yeah, I'm definitely watching the skies now. <laughs> All right. Man, oh, man, that's interesting. All right, you can be turning your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. Hebrews in chapter 11. Is anybody hot? Yes. Do not let them lie to you. It's just right. Warm. Perfect. I agree. You sure you don't want to go to hell when you die? It's a lot warmer. Just joking. Amen. Well, ma'am. You know that Jesus likes coffee, right? He brews. He brews. Yeah, he does. <laughs> hey, man. All right. Well, deep subject for a shallow mind. <laughs> I was uh, looking through my old Bible there a minute ago, and I saw a name from 03, Carolyn Hodges. She uh, came around that curb down there when we had the house across the street. And she went off the embankment and flipped upside down, landed in the creek. And uh, we heard the crash. Derek heard the noise. And uh, I ran down there, and she's laying on the roof because it's upside down. And uh, she's moaning and everything. And, of course, I didn't want to move her because I didn't know how bad she was. She wasn't drowning or nothing, so I left her right there until EMS got here. 
And uh, I got to thinking about how the Lord will get you to the gospel. She supposedly, I found out later, uh, she supposedly was part of that uh, Baptist church over on the frontage road off of 26. Uh, who was that guy that was selling all them bonds or something, the Baptist? You know who I'm talking about? Uh, I forget his name, but uh, she was supposedly trying to be a soul winner, doing all these things, going on visitation and everything. And uh, anyway, at this time, when the EMS got there, they were checking her, her heart. And I didn't agree with it. They pulled her top up over her head, you know, and, and they reached under her bra. And I guess they found some cocaine or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I prayed for her and they got her over to the hospital and my wife and I went over and I went over to witness to her. And that's when she told me that she thought she was saved and she did all this, but she had gotten into some pretty heavy things. And, and uh, I kept trying to tell her, you know, if, if God hasn't, if you say you got saved and God hadn't stopped your drugs, you better check up. He hasn't stopped your fornicating, your cursing, and everything else. You better check up. Paul said to examine yourselves, see if you be of the faith. But anyway, I went to her house, and uh, I knew where she lived. I even talked to her brother and her parents. And I went to her house and knocked on the door, and, and uh, she wouldn't answer. A guy came out, and he said... Uh, She's embarrassed to come out because I'm her boyfriend and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But the Lord gave her another chance, two more chances, to try to reach her. But she was convinced that she's all right in her religion. A little while later, I get a call. It's probably a few weeks later. I get a call from uh, her boyfriend. He said, I just want you to know Carol's dead. I know you cared and you were interested. But think what the Lord did. Put her in the preacher's yard. Amen. I never knew her before that. Put her in there. Give her the gospel one more time. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know if the Lord took her out of, you know, because of the sin and the death of the believer. Or if she was just lost and her number was up. But I was, uh, I went to a job site Friday, Friday evening, Jasmine and I, and a uh, fellow painted the, the 621B that we worked on. He painted, I sent you a picture, but uh, anyway, I was talking to him, and we got to talk for quite a while, and he's telling his story, and he said he lived around the corner. I said, well, I thought that was your house right there. He said, no, that was my son's. He said he died. He was 39 years old, said he was a drunk, and died at 39. And uh, he said he had a heart attack two years ago and three blockages and all that, and a widow maker said it about. But he said he'd come out of that, and he was just saying, he said, you know, they say atheists. There's no atheist in a foxhole. He says, I'll tell you another place there's no atheist. He says, that's on an operating table. <laughs> he said, I'm not an atheist. He says, I'm an agnostic, but I was praying. Anybody know what an agnostic is? Believe there's a higher power. Believe there's a higher power, but they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And except you believe on him, because he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. I am the door. Amen. Amen. And uh, speaking of that, on this tabernacle here in the wilderness, the typology there, only building in the world that was set on foundations of silver. One hundred pound 100 100 pound blocks of silver is what that tabernacle sat on and there was silver here around that righteousness of the gate and there was only there was only one gate in and the fence was three-sided amen that's a picture and a type of the lord jesus christ being the only way that's why the colors are what they are but anyway we got to talking and and uh i finally said to him i said you know if you'd have died, where would you have gone? He said, probably straight to hell.
And I said, well, you're probably right. And I tried to witness to him and talk to him for a while. He got a little nervous, changed the subject a couple of times, but he got back around to listening again. Amen. And uh, I thought we had worked on that machine and did everything. And then they painted it and they said, well, they had a, uh, a couple oil leaks or a couple of leaks you want us to look at. One was a water leak, one was an oil leak. And uh, I thought how the Lord sets up situations for people to hear the gospel. None of you here today are here by accident. You're here by a divine appointment, whether you realize it or not. Amen. Amen. And I, I think about people like, this man is 64, and he said he knew he'd go straight to hell, but yet he's not willing to do nothing about it except be an agnostic. I said, that won't work. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. It's not the, it's not the church. It's not the preacher. It's God. Amen. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe on him, as the scripture has said, then you are destined to spend an eternity in hell. Where the rich man said to Abraham, said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he might dip his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. Amen. You need to know without a doubt whether you're going or not. And the Bible says that you have a birth certificate if you're saved. First John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, not hope so, not wish so, that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. Amen. And if you know that you have eternal life, you should know what it's based on. Now, most of you know, uh, I used to ask people, when did you get saved? And I've heard all kinds of things. Well, I give you my testimony. And they start telling you about uh, their ear or their eye or their nose or something happened and it got miraculously healed. And, and that's their salvation. All right. Or they saw a vision. Amen. While they were smoking dope. <laughs> Some of the best Bible reading I ever had was sitting in a dentist chair on helium. <laughs> I was reading scriptures in dark, bold print in that Bible while I was waiting for that stuff to take effect. Now, I've never found them verses again. <laughs> yeah. But you need to know where you're going according to the scriptures. I asked this man, he's got 80 acres right there on the creek. And I looked over and some other property that he has where his shop is and all. There's a pasture there and one next to it. And all of a sudden I seen something move and I looked and there's two ponies over there chasing each other around. But uh, I asked him, I asked him about looking at the pasture, the meadow. You know my old uh, illustration I use about have you walked along a creek or a river in the springtime and heard the birds singing, saw the flowers blooming, and, amen, and you're looking at a beautiful green meadow or some rolling hills, and you look at that, and I'd ask, and I, I told him, I said, no matter where I've been in the world, I've asked this same question to every person that I talk to. I asked them the same question, and I said, I don't want you to answer. I'm going to answer for you. And I said, I asked, how did you feel when you were standing there in that meadow or along that creek or river bank and the water's rolling and uh, you could smell the flowers in the air and everything? I said, I'll tell you exactly how you felt. I said, you went like this. You went, I could live here the rest of my life is what you said to yourself. You ever been there? Mm -hmm. 
You ever wonder why? I said, because if you believe the Bible, where did man start? In the garden. Where is man trying to get back to? Subconsciously, he's trying to get back to the garden. But it's not the garden, it's the God of the garden. And what man has right here is that void in their life that something's missing. There's a hole in the soul. And that happened when Adam sinned in the garden. Because the Lord told him, he said, In the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Physically, he lived to be 930 years old. Spiritually, he died that day. And when he died that day, he lost fellowship with God because that's what he had in the garden. So man, every man that's been born since Adam has been born with that hole right here in the soul, the deadness of the soul. And that's why Titus chapter 3, we went over that Thursday night here with you, that Titus chapter 3 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by the renewing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost. The prefix re means there was something there previously. So they're redoing it, just like replenish, in Genesis 128, talking to Adam, and in chapter 9, talking to Noah. But why do we need to regenerate it or renewing of the Holy Ghost? Because we lost it in Adam, and that left a void in your life. I said man is incurably religious. He's got to worship something. It might be his car. It might be his self. It might be uh, some idol uh might be a, what was the name of them dolls I had when I was a kid? Oh. Troll doll. Mm -hmm. Amen. Used to have a troll doll. And, uh, or a rabbit's foot. People talk, that's my lucky rabbit's foot. I said it wasn't too lucky for the rabbit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> There's a three-legged rabbit running around somewhere, <laughs> and you're holding his foot. <laughs> and, uh. So that void was there. And you know, the man said, you're right. I said, that's because you need a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You try to fill it with sex. You try to fill it with religion. You try to fill it with a uh, career. You try to fill it with uh, cars and houses and money. But when you acquire those things, if you ever do, once you reach that, reach that plateau, then you're empty all over again. It does not satisfy. Amen. You can be religious. You can go to a Baptist church, carry a King James Bible, and still be empty. Because you've never repented of your sin and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. In Hebrews in chapter 11, I want to talk about a man today that... Uh, And James, James said that in James 2.23, the scripture, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Could you imagine having, having that uh, title of being called the friend of God? I think, uh, let's see, let me look here a minute. Abraham is mentioned in the Bible 230 times. He was spoken of through a lot of books, through the Gospels, through Paul's writings. Amen. And chapter 11 is called the, it's called the Christian's Hall of Fame. And I'm going to start in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Amen. In other words, faith is believing God even though you don't see it. And he says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. I mean, when you open the Bible and it says in the beginning... God created the heaven and the earth. 
Amen. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Amen. When we read that, how do we know that? By faith. We believe that by faith. But you know, when you believe something by faith, and you trust the scripture, the Lord will prove it out to you as you go along. I didn't do it this week. I don't know if I'll do it next week either, but the pre-Adamic earth. We have scientists tell us that the earth is millions of years old. But the Bible from Adam till now is only 6,000 years. Which one's right? They're both right. Amen. And Adam wasn't some guy dragging his wife around by the head of her hair of her head. Amen. Going, ugh. Make fire. <laughs> you try naming all the animals. And all the species. It's a very wise man. He just, and he wasn't deceived by the way his wife was. And he gave himself for his wife. But both of them are right. And science has proved that out, whether they realize it or not. When they wanted to put a rocket on the moon, they couldn't quite get it right. And one Christian scientist said, well, the Bible says there was a day that the earth stood still. They factored that in and they landed on the moon. When they set up the spaceship to set it on there, what did it have? Big, long legs. You know why? Because they thought the moon was as old as the earth. And they thought they were going to sit down in cosmic dust. But the earth, the moon is fairly new. Why? Because God had placed it in the heavens after he recreated, after the destruction from the fall of Lucifer. Amen. So they're both right. They just don't know it. If you believe in the pre-Adamic earth, you're called a gap theorist. That you believe in a gap theory between verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. But like I tell them, the only gap is between their ears. They can't read. When the earth was flooded in Noah's day, do you realize there's not enough water on this earth as it stands right now, even though three quarters of it is water, to cover the top of every mountain? So that's why they said it was a local flood. <laughs> but the Bible says that he opened up the windows of heaven and broke up the fountains of the deep. And the water rushed up and rushed in. That's why there's ice on Mars, I believe. Because when it abated, it went back through to the deep. All that has scripture. Amen. But you know what? Some of that you can't find in any of the other Bibles because if they distort one scripture, it throws off a whole doctrine. Amen. And that's what the devil intended to do. But we look here. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, what things are not seen that make up things that do appear? Huh? Here. Atoms. Okay, here, Atoms. Hey, Can you see an atom with the naked eye? No. They put them together. What do they do? They make up a material object. Hey, Ben. wonder how these stupid people back there in the caveman days knew that. <laughs> Reckon it was the inspiration of the Almighty. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You see, Cain was a religious man too. I told the children Thursday, I said this. I'm not saying because for any other reason, but when Pope John Paul died, they asked me, said, Preacher, what do you think about the Pope? I said, I believe he went to hell. You know, that shocked him. He said, why? 
He said, well, he believes in God, just not the same way you do. I said, let me ask you something. Did Cain believe in God? Yeah, God talked to him. Was he religious? Yeah. He made up a sacrifice and carried it to him to offer it up to God. So he was religious. God talked to him. God even told him, he said, hey, if thou do as well, shall not be accepted of thee? He was the oldest of the twins. He would have been over Abel. But his pride wouldn't let him. So what did he do? He killed his brother Abel. First murder in this world took place over religion, how to worship God. The Bible says we have to receive the scripture according to the word of God and the word of God according to scripture. Amen. And you have to believe what it says. The Bible says, for there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. One mediator. Some people want you to go through two or three. But he says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. How did Abel know what to offer? Because his father had offered it after God had made the God initiated the first sacrifice when he took his Masonic leaves off, his Masonic apron, amen, and made him coats of skin. How'd they get the skins off the animal? He had to shed his blood. Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So they had to shed the blood, made him coats of skin. Well, Adam passed that on down. Abel saw it. Abel knew that God required blood. Cain says, I like my way better. How about a nice pretty basket of fruit? I mean, I got pomegranates and mangoes and pineapples and bananas. Amen. Because he was a tiller of the ground. So he made this nice basket up and he's going to offer it to God. God said, no. It'd be like me going out and knocking the windshield out of James's car. I said, all right, James, I'll give you that white bowl there for the damage I did. <laughs> well, that'd be great if he would, what, accept it. Well, he's gonna be mad at you. But he's not going to accept it. Amen. Well, the basket of fruit sure looked a lot nicer than that bloody lamb. Problem is, God said he required blood. He wouldn't accept it. You can do all kind of worship. You can do all kind of work, religious work. That's not going to get you to heaven. I know when my son-in-law was in the Philippines, he watched those folks over there on Easter nail themselves to a cross. It actually drive nails in their hands. Thought they were making God happy. The only one that made the Lord happy for your soul was the Lord Jesus Christ being nailed to a cross. And he says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith. And, and he is speaking today. He's dead, but you just heard it. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For because his, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteous, which is by faith. 
By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child and she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. And speaking of Isaac here, and that's who we're going to go look at in a moment. He said, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They didn't hadn't received them in their lifetime, but they saw them afar off. They embraced them. They believed. And they lived like they believed. And that's the way we're supposed to be. Our home's not here. Our home's in heaven. We are citizens of a heavenly country. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have, have had opportunity to, to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Isn't that what God the Father did? God the Father gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know that some of the new Bibles say that he gave his son, left out the begotten? Well, aren't we all sons of God? Yeah, but he is begotten through the Holy Ghost, amen, by the Virgin Mary. And he says, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Amen. Turn back to Genesis in chapter 22, and we'll read the account. Isn't that artwork pretty? We had a lady in the church. The Gutenberg Bible had the artwork in it, and she started doing mine until I made them mad and they left. What did you say this time, Pastor? Genesis chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Well, he did have another son, but he was by a handmaid, Hagar, and not by promise, like Isaac was of Sarah. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Do you know where Mount Moriah is? That's the modern day Calvary. That's where the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. And offer him up there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now imagine that. God had made this promise. We read over in Hebrews chapter 11 how he had promised that that he would make him a great seed, you know, innumerable as the stars in the sky. 
And he's telling them to take that son, the only begotten son, because he was 100 years old when he was born. And he says, take him up and offer him as a burnt offering. Sounds crazy, don't it? But he said he was tempting Abraham. He was trying him. Verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clayed the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Think about that. He believed God. He had such faith in God that he got up first thing in the morning and said, okay, God said do it. I, I know God made a promise to me and I know that he's going to keep that promise. He did that by faith. Why? He said, he believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Simple, childlike faith, all right? He didn't sit there and say, well, man, if I offer him up as a burnt offering, that means i got to kill him, cut him up, and put him on the fire. Man, but, but God, you promised that you were going to give me all these seed after him. I, I you know, I, I can't do that. He didn't do that, but he believed God. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, it said, Abraham saw the far off. The gospel was preached to Abraham. How? Through Isaac. And he says, and Abraham said unto his young men, abide you here with the ass. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. You see the faith there? He said, we're going to go worship and then we're coming back, both of us. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. He's going, you know, like, uh, Dad, uh, I see the wood and the fire, but, you know, like, uh, where's the sacrifice? <laughs> hey, man. He says, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham, being a prophet, prophetically said right here, and Abraham said, my son, my son, God will provide a lamb for himself. Didn't say that? No. No, it didn't. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lift up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, that's not a lamb. That's a ram. Back here in verse 8, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. He did not say that he was going to provide a lamb for himself. He said he was going to provide himself amen himself now who is the lord jesus christ he is god amen take heed therefore unto yourselves and over all the flock of which the holy ghost has made the overseers to feed the church of god which he he god hath purchased with his own blood when did god ever had blood that holy thing that was born of mary Amen. That should be called the Son of God. So in Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 
When did God ever lay his life down? He did it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father gave God the Son through God the Holy Ghost. Now, if you turn over to John chapter 1, John chapter 1 and verse 29. In verse 28, it says, These things were done in Bethlehem beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, John the Baptist was baptizing. And it says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith what? Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. God said he would provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. Amen. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ die on the cross, he was beaten, the Bible says in Isaiah 52, that his visage was marred more than any man. They beat him to a bloody pulp. He shed his blood. His body went to the tomb. He said, Father, into thy hands commend I my spirit. His spirit returned unto the Father. Where did his soul go? The soul went into hell. The Bible says... The sorrows of death compassed me. The pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Now, when the psalmist said that, he said it as a prophet because David never went to hell. In Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 13, Psalm 116 and Psalm 16 and Psalm 18, you'll find all the references of Jesus Christ in hell. Guess what he became? The burnt offering. Why? If you die in your sin... Are you going to a cross? Or are you going to hell? You're not going to a cross. So God himself became that burnt offering that Isaac typified back in Genesis chapter 22. It's recorded also in Hebrews chapter 11. And he rose again the third day. You know why? <laughs> to save you from going to hell if you'll repent. So what I need to repent of, preacher? Bible says that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. We talked about this last week when I heard this other preacher say this, how his friend trivialized sin he told the story about having all these parking tickets he hadn't paid and when he went to court he figures he's got seven hundred dollars in his pocket he's just going to pay the tickets so when the judge pronounced him guilty with the tickets and all he said well i can pay him he said no so he trivialized it to the point he said well i can just let it go it ain't nothing i go to court i'll just uh Pay it and they'll let me go. He said, no, you're going to jail. The Bible says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. There's 613 or 14 laws in the scripture, not just the Ten Commandments. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 20 for a moment. Law is given twice, once over in Deuteronomy, but here in chapter 20 of Exodus, in verse 1, God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. For that is in the water under the earth. Now there's some churches that don't even 
want you to put a cement statue out of a fish or something because they're saying you're making something out of water, you're making something in the earth, but they don't read the rest of it. See, it wasn't that you can't have these things in your yard for yard ornaments, but he says this in verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. This man that I was talking to Friday said that he was an agnostic because he said if there's really a God out there, why does he let all this stuff happen? He lost a six-year-old niece. She died at six years old. I said, well, let me tell you something about that little six-year-old niece. I said, she might have grown up to be a whore and a heathen and a drug addict or a drunkard. And she'd have died and went to hell. But you know where she's at now? Under the age of accountability. The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen. I said, the Bible says that God visits the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation of the children of them that hate me. Now, each child's still going to give an account personally as they get older for their own sin. But a lot of that stuff is following them because of their parents. He looked at me a little different that time. But you see, when you take these statues and you carry them around, can you imagine having to carry your God? And then you're going to sit it down and you're going to bow down and worship it? I got to tell you this story. Provident Hospital is a Catholic hospital. And when you go in there, they got crosses in all the rooms, little plaques. And they got a dead Jesus hanging on them crosses. Jesus on a stick. He's not on a stick anymore. And he's not dead. But me, I didn't have much tooth. I went down to the chapel. And in the chapel, there was a statue of Mary. And I put a gospel track between her fingers that said, Why is Mary weeping? I got a phone call. Uh -oh. <laughs> the priest over there called me and said, Pastor Townsend, some of your people have been down here and passing out tracks. And they put one in the hands of the statue, Mary. I said, oh, that wasn't my people. That was me. <laughs> he kindly informed me not to ever do that again, not to come back there. But I did it to the archbishop in England, too. The archbishop, the crypts they have at the Canterbury Cathedral, they have them laying there like this. And some of you have heard it before. I went in there and I had the gospel track that said, how can I be saved and be sure in big red letters? Yeah. And this archbishop had died in the 1500s and I stuck one between his fingers. And this Englishman and two women walk in and they're walking by me. What's that in his hand? Archbishop. <laughs> So the other one says, I don't know. And the guy says, what? How can I be saved and be sure? And he snatched the track. And I took his picture. And you're not supposed to take pictures in the cathedral. But anyway, I took his picture. And he goes, you're not taking my picture, are you? I said, you don't mind, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Looked at me like that and took the track and walked off. I said, it's probably the first track the archbishop ever passed out. And he did that. 400, 500 years after he's dead. Amen. <laughs> so the next time I went back there, a couple of years later, they had roped it off. They put those little velvet blue ropes all the way around. But I got long arms. I still did it. Amen. People get so stiff over religion. I think the Lord had a sense of humor. Amen. Amen. You did look in the mirror this morning, right?
I told you all the story. I was praying one day, waiting for the hydraulic shop to open. And I got to a point that I was reading and said, pray for my son. He's a lunatic. <laughs> I rolled in the seat laughing like crazy. People walked by wondering what's wrong with him. But my mom, that's something she would have said, pray for my son. He's a lunatic. We were street preaching in Swansea. And uh, my mom came in from Florida with my dad. And I said, hey, mom, why don't you come in with us? We're going street preaching in Swansea. It's on a Saturday. She says, all right. You know, she wanted to hear her boy preach. So we drive down to Swansea. And you know how Swansea is. One main street. Buildings on both sides. A little tunnel. And a little restaurant down towards the end there. We parked about middle ways. And I got out and I started preaching at mom. I want to see my mom say, and I'm preaching and preaching. She says, I'm hungry. I said, in a minute, mom, I kept preaching, preaching, man. She gets out. You'd had to know my mom. I mean, she's, she's tough as nails. She gets out, slams the door. I'm going to get something to eat. Heads on down the street, walks up to the cafe. As a guy walks out, he goes, Bleh. Mom did a U-turn and walked back and got in the truck, slammed the door, and sat there. So I could see her saying, pray for my son. He's a lunatic. Amen. Another satisfying customer. And he says, verse 6, And showing mercy unto thousands that love, that love me and keep my commandments, of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You ever just go, oh, Lord, that's taking his name in vain. It isn't just the other words. He says, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. That's just 10 of the commandments out of 600 and some of them. The Bible says all men are liars. The Bible says there's none that doeth good. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. God seeks you. How's he do it? He said, God said he chose the foolishness of preaching. To save them that would believe. Amen. He said the law was a schoolmaster. To bring us unto Christ. You see. The law kept you out. Christ let you in. Amen. The question today is. When did you get lost? In order to get found. Or saved. You've got to get lost. So when did you get lost? Every person I've ever asked that. They look like a calf looking at a new gate. <laughs> Unless they're saved. If they're saved, they know what I'm talking about. If they're religious, they don't. What do you mean, when did I get lost? Paul told Timothy that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. How do you use it lawfully? By showing the sinner that they're sinners, that they've sinned against the holy God. 
And the consequences for that sin is death and hell. Say, preacher, I don't believe that. Oh, yeah, you do. You just won't admit that. See that young man back there with the dark hair and a little white shirt? <laughs> Let me ask you something. Who taught you to lie? Uh, <laughs> nope. You knew how to lie. Nobody had to teach you. You already knew how. How'd you know it was wrong? Huh? Your conscience. You see, God had put in us his law in our heart. It's called a conscience. You probably don't remember the first lie you ever told, but I remember how I felt when I did lie. I was scared to death. I remember my little girl, my biological daughter, Tabitha. I asked her something. She was lying. And she goes, honest, Dad, Willie, I'm serious. <laughs> she was scared to death. She knew she was lying. Because her heart told her so. Thou shalt not lie. It's, he said, it's a conscience, either accusing us or it's excusing us. So when you're young and you're tender, like you take my hands, they're not as strong as James. You know, I can touch something hot, probably hold it longer than Jasmine could, but not as long as James can because he has the bestest hands. Amen. <laughs> he does. I've seen him well. And uh, he can handle that. You know why? His hands have become calloused. Your heart used to tell you that you were a liar or a fornicator or adulterer. And everything you did, you did it in the dark. When you committed fornication in the back seat of the car with that little girl, you took her up in a dark place somewhere. I told people before, just go over here to the Skyline Club, turn the bright lights on one day, and it'd be nothing but stains and petric odors and just disgusting. So they put dim lights on at night, and people go there, and they covet other men's wives. You know that old saying, birds of a feather flock together? Well, see, if you're a liar, you hang with liars. If you're a drunkard, you hang with drunkards. If you're a fornicator, you hang with fornicators. If you're a drug addict, you can hang with the drug addict crowd. You know why? It doesn't bother your conscience. Because we all mess up. Is that right? You hang with the crowd that you're like. And so your heart gets calloused where you don't feel the heat anymore. But you know what? If I'm going to bleed, i got to cut through that callus. I can cut myself on a callus and I don't feel it. You can see the cut, but you don't feel it. But if I get past that callus into the meat and I bleed, boy, that's sore. Well, the Bible says, for the word of God is quick, it means it's alive, it's powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. That's why people have come to church, and I've been there myself, where it sounds like the preacher knew everything about you. And you think, man, it's like he's talking right at me. You ever been there? Mm -hmm. Some of you are like that today. That's why when the evangelists come through to preach and all, I don't even meet with them anymore. I don't take them out to eat. I tell them, go eat, bring me the ticket. 
You know why? Because if we sat down together and we begin to talk, I might tell them about the problems I'm having in the church and who I think is a problem and why I think they're a problem. And then he'll get up and he'll start preaching on it, trying to help me out. So I don't say nothing to them. I only talk to them after they're done. That way you can't say he must have told them. So because that heart hard heart of yours is calloused over now that conscience God said he chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us is the power of God and the salvation and it cuts and people either repent or get mad I've had to get mad and repent <laughs> Amen. So let me ask you something today. Are you a sinner? What did he say? All men are liars. He said, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he's guilty of how many? Then oh. you're a sinner. So you make it trivial. Well, it's just a little white lie. There's no such thing as a white lie. It's either a lie or it's a truth. Now, I don't know what kind of sin you have in your life. I got enough problems of my own. But I'm going to tell you who does know. God. The eyes are the Lord in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He knows every secret thought. He knows your lust over another man's wife or another wife's husband or whatever. He knows. He wants you to see yourself as he sees you through the law. Now, they tell me, and I did it once, and it appeared so, that if you look at a red object through a red lens, it appears white. So if you look at your scarlet sin through the red blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it appears to be the righteousness of God because he'd have made you clean. So when God looks at you after you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't see that wicked sinner anymore. He sees the blood of his own dear son. And he says, you're justified. Nicodemus was a religious man. He was a Pharisee. And he came to Jesus by night. And he started trying to flatter the Lord. And the Lord said, you must be born again. <laughs> he said, except you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, but is within you. And that's why a lot of people, when they're lost, they pick up the Bible and say, ah, I don't get nothing out of that. I can't understand it i got to go get me one of them other Bibles that make it easier to understand. They can't understand it because the Spirit's not there. The first thing a person has to come to is the realization that they're a sinner and they can't save themselves. I told the children on Thursday, the young people on Thursday, my testimony of how I was on a missionary trip on my way back when I got under conviction and got saved and how I was about to jump out the airplane at 5,600 feet without a parachute, get away from the preacher. <laughs> Crazy, ain't it? But as you can see, I didn't jump. Lord <laughs> intervened. I said, that's Crazy. I was religious. I taught Sunday school at another church for three years. I was religious. I told them how I got out of the truck on the side of the road and it felt like somebody lifted a ton of weight off my shoulders. I'm, I'm telling you, I said, it's Jesus to come into my heart. And I felt so good. Couldn't explain the feeling. And if I'd have went by feelings, I'd still be on my way to hell. This one, uh, I was carrying one of these. This is my wife's back in 1977. I was carrying one called the Living Bible. Would you read that out loud?
the one that's highlighted. That one? Saul boiled with rage. You son of a bitch. He yelled to him. Do you think I... <laughs> that's a Bible? That's a Bible. Yep. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Nah. Mm-hmm. Where's that? Yeah. Makes it easier to understand. <laughs> you see, everything that calls itself a Bible is not a Bible. The fun thing with that book is when you take it to some of these little proper little old ladies, you know, that have been religious for years, and you ask them to read it out loud. Most of them stop. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> She's just doing what I asked her. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. When did you get lost? You see, when I got under conviction after that little relationship I had with this spirit on the side of the road for three years, I was religious. I carried that. I read that thing everywhere I went. I had a real feeling. You know what Paul said? He said to try the, or John said, try the spirit, see if there be a God. Paul said that you might receive another spirit or another gospel or another Jesus. And I had that other Jesus. And with it comes a real feeling, real spirit. I remember Pastor Randall preaching one day. He says, if you want a feeling, step in that closet right there, bend over. I'll give you a good kick. Or he said, stick your finger in that light socket you want to feel him. <laughs> but it took the preaching of the word of God by a preacher that says some pretty hard things for me to see myself. And I got down by the water fountain where we landed at Eagle Aviation while they were unloading the plane. I squatted down there and I said, Lord, if I got to be as good as you to get to heaven, and if all men are liars, and if the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind, I've never done that. I said, how am I going to go? How am I going to get there? And the Lord, by the Spirit of God, brought that verse back that Pastor Randall and I have been arguing over for, I guess, six months or more. And it said, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That was the faith of Christ imparted to me. And that day, I said, Lord, if I'm going, you've got to take me because there is no other way. No amount of good works, good deeds. I used to think that every church was the same. Like I said, I grew up going to a Mennonite church. I've been to Greek Orthodox. I've been to the Roman Catholic. I've been to the Pentecostal Church of God. I've been to these places, and I thought just all of them were the same. It didn't matter. Amen. But as Brother Cunningham's church sign says in Aliquip, Pennsylvania, <coughs> it does matter what you believe. I know he couldn't take the preaching. <laughs> Wimp. <laughs> so when did you get lost? When did you see yourself as the scripture has said? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He said he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Amen? Well, if you're here this morning, I don't care how young you are, how old you are, if you've never been born again, today would be a good day. You know what the Bible says? Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know why it says now? Because you might not live out the day. 
He didn't say today. He said now is the day. Because you might not live long enough. I remember Pastor Randall preaching. He said you could go out. You could pull out his parking lot and get killed. And I remember a family in the church. that just somebody pulled out. Made a left hand turn. Girl come over. Hit him head on. Phil there. His wife. Kids. They were upset about something. But anyway they pulled out here. And got nailed right there. At the stop sign. You just never know. One or all of us could be dead before the day's out. Amen. We went and got some courage to come back. <laughs> Hoorah. Well, that's all I've got. I'm sorry, hon. That's all I have. She's been getting on me about my English. She says it ain't right. <laughs> Amen. Brother Dave, if you would. Lord God, we say good Lord again. We do thank you for this day. We do thank you for the preaching of thy word, Lord God. I pray that uh, everybody uh, heard the word, Lord God, and received the word, Lord, and Father, that uh, it got in there and, and pricked their hearts, Lord. I, I pray that if you're not saved today, Lord God, that, that Father, that uh, you'll deal with them, Lord, uh, accordingly, Lord, and Father, that uh, they'll come to the amazing grace of thy love, Lord, and, and be saved uh, today, Lord. Father, I do pray, Lord, that you look after each and every one of us, guide us and guard us until we meet at the next appointed time. We thank you and praise the Lord Jesus Christ's name. We pray. Amen. Amen.